machine learning is poised to permeate all aspects of our lives. And um, for those of us who are keen on this technology, its disruptive tendencies are already being noticeable in um, certain fields, right? Now, one of them, I assume, is uh, going to be a major area of discussion for today's episode, and uh, that would be machine learning and computational pathology. Now, computational pathology is the aspect of pathology that deals with um, data, right? So what we do is we source uh, patient information, right? So it could be his histology images, it could be uh, meta metadata itself. And what we do is we combine all this information and we try to extract um, features, we try to extract um, patterns and we analyze features, right? Now, to help us understand this budding field of uh, computer science is uh, um, Dr. Mohammed Amgad, right? Now, Dr. Mohammed Amgad is a medical doctor from Egypt and a current PhD candidate at Emory University. And we both actually share a lab at Feinberg uh, School of Medicine. So welcome, Dr. Amgad. I'm happy to be here. How, how are you doing? I'm doing great, I'm doing great. So now, usually when I do this, I have my guests uh, give us a lowdown on uh, their journey through their education and why they got into the field of research that they're currently doing. So uh, Dr. Amgad, if you can go ahead and uh, tell us how this, um, you know, this urge for discovery, this, you know, longing for answers to um, the underlying uh, questions of the universe uh, came to you. And uh, just walk us through your undergrad, your graduate work, uh, your medical school work, and how you actually transitioned to being a researcher in uh, machine learning. Sure. Um, so uh, I knew I was interested in science for since high school, so, you know, for a while. Um, but I wasn't sure how to get uh, into my fields of interest. So uh, in, in high school, I was mostly interested in chemistry and biology, and uh, maybe the main entrance into this kind of um, uh, maybe passion was uh, through uh, the MIT OpenCourseWare uh, lectures, uh, specifically the uh, introduction to biology uh, that uh, Eric Lander and uh, Rob Weinberg uh, co-administered together. It was an introductory biology course. And um, of course, Eric Lander was just in the news recently uh, as a science advisor. And um, anyway, so that was my very first interest in the idea of science and and uh, and research uh, as a broad general term. Uh, but I didn't know what to do or, and how to specifically do it. And I then entered medical school. Um, and for the non-American audience, medical school is an undergraduate discipline uh, in most countries. Um, where, but it's longer. So it's, instead of four years, we, we take six and a half years of medical study. Uh, so after my fifth year of medical school, I, uh, I was awarded um, a fully funded internship in Okinawa uh, at the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology in Japan. And that was following, I just had like one month of, of volunteer lab experience, but nothing I would call significant or major before that. That was my first real uh, immersion in science. And um, I was working um, uh, over there with uh, Professor Marianne Price, who had her own you know, lab there and, and research uh, unit. And we were working mostly on developmental biology and uh, wet lab and, uh, and, and, and that kind of um, uh, world. Um, so long story short, one of the postdocs who was uh, working in that lab, his name is Marco, and uh, he had all of these images of um, uh, fluorescent images that he wanted to analyze but couldn't really do so using just uh, uh, traditional methods or just the, um, uh, commercial software that was available. Uh, at the time, I knew I only had uh, a few months, up to a year, that you know was extensible and to come up with a publication so that I can apply for, you know, a key PhD program after my medical school. So I, I really wanted to get that publication. It wasn't, uh, the wet lab was, um, it's just a longer, you know, it's a much longer term kind of thing. And I was still doing my wet lab, but I was like, okay, let me try something on the side. And that's when I learned programming. I learned MATLAB programming. And, 
you never know where the journey takes you. Now, uh, after I did that, that you know went into a publication, and eventually I applied to a PhD in biomedical informatics uh, with the Professor Lee Cooper, who was at Emory back then. Now he's at Northwestern. I moved with him, and uh, yeah, that's what I do full time now. Programming is uh, my 100% of my uh, research. Wow, that's that's awesome. Wow. So you've uh, gone through a quite of a whirlwind when it comes to your education, right? <laughs> And <laughs> the beauty of that is you've actually traversed different countries in your journey as well. <laughs> true, true, true. Right. So I started how in the Emirates uh, and then Egypt for medical school and then Japan for a year, back to Egypt to finish my medical degree and then now in the States. <laughs> wow, that's, that's awesome. So how is that transition from, you know, a more physiological background to a more computer science background, right? So how, how long did it take you to get the, um, the nuance, the lay of the land when it comes to programming? It took me a long time. I'm not, you know, to be honest. So the, uh, to be completely, you know, for full disclosure here, the, for one year, I was basically learning basics. Uh, that's the year, even though it resulted in a publication. And the reason it resulted in publication is I was focusing uh, on the right topic. So I had research experience before it. I knew how to write papers and how to uh, find interesting questions. I just didn't know how to answer them with programming. And I uh, definitely had very little experience with um, image processing, which was what this um, project was about. It was actually not necessarily machine learning. It was image processing, um, uh, kind of classical image processing. And that was really the majority of my time in the first year, just learning basics. Now, going from basics into actually calling myself uh, a programmer, or at least being comfortable with that description, being comfortable saying that I uh, you know, I can be comfortable sharing code and uh, contributing to open source, the kind of thing that I do on a daily basis now, uh, that took a longer time. It's a much longer term thing that I, I think until a year ago, uh, I would still be hesitant to really characterize myself as a, a real data scientist. I, of course, there's, uh, I'm sure you heard about imposter syndrome that was you know, with me, you know, from the beginning for a few years, but, but for sure until last year, uh, when I um, when I finished all my classes and I was doing re research full time, that I started, you know, now I can very comfortably say, okay, yeah, I I'm a data scientist. Awesome, awesome. So, is there a language in particular you feel um, sort of gels with your style of thinking and um, how you're able to express uh, your thoughts when it comes to computer science? So, I mean, as a data scientist, there are different languages you can uh, use, right? So, MATLAB, uh, you can use uh, Python, R. So, which one do you think actually sort of um, complements your your work more than the others? Sure. So in order of uh, preference, I would say I would put Python at the top. That's what I use every day. And that's by choice. Uh, I mean, technically, our lab uses Python all the time, but I, I did start with MATLAB. So Python is the top, followed by MATLAB and followed by R. And it's not that R, R has an extremely good uh, community, but if you're talking syntax-wise, it has a terrible syntax, in my opinion. And uh, it's, uh, but Python is so simple that you really do focus on the important things, uh, which is the research and uh, the, the question at hand, as opposed to really being bogged down by um, peculiarities of the syntax. But it's also not as simple as MATLAB, uh, which I find very good for certain things, but the fact that it, it has a, that it's, first of all, it's not open source, and I, I'm a proponent of open source, but also the idea that it's, um, it has much less flexibility. It's not a general programming language as opposed to Python, which you can use to uh, create, you know, websites, uh, do data science, do all sorts of things without really having to mentally switch uh, what you're doing. Interesting. All right. So we won't get the R folks uh, pissed off. So we'll just move <laughs> on from that. All right. So right, let's, right. Yeah. Let's try to segue into your work. All right. So, um, you know, we all know that a pain point that plagues, uh, 
machine learning in general is uh, the lack of uh, quality training data, right? Now, if there's one monkey wrench in the AI cog, right, it, it'd be this, right? And this right. uh, problem seems to be more pronounced when we're looking at computational pathology. So this seems to be the crux of uh, your work. So um, can you set the stage for um, um, why you actually chose this uh, area to attack and how that's uh, progressed um, when it comes to your work uh, till today? Sure. So there is the official reason and there is the real reason. <laughs> so the official reason is that, uh, as you correctly pointed out, this is a really, really pressing problem in uh, really, it's a more general problem in medical domains, uh, in, in application of machine learning in medicine, is that really, so people talk about big data, we have a lot of big data, it's true, but we don't have a lot of labeled big data, we don't have a lot of data where we have medical professionals, pathologists, radiologists, whoever, whoever it may be that we're uh, interested in, these are experts whose time is very expensive and very difficult to get, and uh, it, it's, um, and for that reason, and, and there are, of course, concerns regarding data sharing and patient privacy and so on that really make um, open source data set or open data sets um, quite rare. And in the domain of pathology, specifically computational pathology, uh, it's, uh, it's almost impossible to have open source data. Maybe there is one famous exception, which is Chameleon that emerged maybe, I think, in 2014 or 2015. So even that is quite recent. Uh, but really, other than that, and maybe a couple of other data sets uh, lately, including ours that uh, we published, uh, there's very little data. That's the official reason, but the real reason why I chose to choose uh, that field is uh, I was doing an internship, uh, summer internship at Frost Tissue Diagnostics, and, um, and uh, we needed data. So, and the way I found that we were generating data in-house was, uh, as you know, everybody does, you get someone to generate the data and then you wait for a month or so for pathologists to look at the data and it's very tedious and, uh, and it seemed like a really silly way of doing things when everybody's generating their own data and, and spending months and months of man hours uh, or woman hours, you know, just manpower on this. Uh, so we decided, okay, let's try to, uh, make this simpler for myself so I have uh, my own data, but also make it for everybody else. So we released it publicly. Interesting, interesting. So um, that actually brings us to this idea of um, histopathology, right? This field of histopathology. So for those who don't know, this is sometimes uh, called uh, nanopathology, right? So this idea that we take um, tissue blocks, right? And we slice them, we put them in slides and we magnify them, right? So um, right. Now, let's talk about why histopathology imaging is a problem to begin with, right? So we know about the problems with um, computational pathology, but with histopathology, we have to go through different processes, right, to prepare our tissue. So staining, annotation, and um, so why do all these stages affect uh, the data set and the availability of um, well-annotated data sets? So these stages of histopathology, Right. So it's a, it's a very interesting um, set of problems that I would say probably only apply partially to certain specific other fields, like, for example, satellite microscopy. That's the, the field that I can sort of think of is sort of maps. And it's very interesting because we deal at the microscopic scale, but our clo the closest field to us in terms of these kinds of problems is satellite imagery. Uh, so the, the the key problem that we have with digital pathology or computational pathology analysis is that when you scan a slide, this is a microscopic slide, so they are extremely large. Uh, so one slide is in the order of you know um, 100,000 pixels uh, by 100,000 pixels or so. Uh, that extreme magnitude means that all of the developed algorithms, the things that uh, people think of when they think of computational computer vision, you know, they think of self-driving cars and uh, detection of cat and dog uh, pictures and, and, and all these kinds of things, they usually rely on small images, you know, things in the order of 256 by 256, 500 by 512 by 512, really orders and orders of magnitude smaller than the uh, 
the images we deal with. And hence the comparison I made with satellite imagery where they have the same issues. In fact, a lot of the software uh, that is used to view post light images is an extension of or uses the kind of the same backend as a lot of the satellite, uh, the software that things like Google Earth and uh, use. Um, anyway, so that presents a set of problems that we typically have to deal with. There's various ways, you know, you could tile the images and do analysis, you know, one tile at a time, which of course presents problems with continuity of the analysis and uh, and scale, how long it takes to analyze a single slide and so on. Uh, there are other groups that focus on machine learning that uses the idea of attention. Basically, the, the, the computer learns where to look in the slide, sort of like the pathologist would, and therefore you don't have to analyze the whole thing, but just the relevant areas of the slide. Um, so that's one aspect. The, the magnitude of the image is one key and fundamental, fundamentally important aspect. The other important aspect or limitation that we really have to deal with with this field is the fact that Pathology slides are physical things. They're physical slides. You literally take a patient's tissue, you slice it, you uh, uh, stain it, and then you fix it in, in formal, typically. Uh, you know, that's, there are many special stains, but let's uh, take the day-to-day -day, uh, case. And then you, 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 you fix it in paraffin, right? And then you, uh, you slice it into very, very thin slices and uh, you put it on a glass slide and, uh, and then that's what the pathologist looks at under the microscope to make the diagnosis. Now, when it comes to scanning these, there's all sorts of issues. So you get the problems related to the scanning, but compounded with it are the problems related to the manual preparation of a physical sample. Right, the samples degrade over time. There is a different uh, levels of hematoxylin and AOC in these different, they're the two most commonly used stains. Different levels of staining in different slides, different staining protocols and routine from different laboratories and hospitals. And you have to deal with all of that variability. And it's, uh, it, we sometimes joke that uh, an algorithm developed on a particular set of slides is only guaranteed to work on that set of slides. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, uh, of course, we try not to do that. We try to really go for generalization, but that's kind of how much variability there is. And, uh, and that's really the second fundamental problem that we have to deal with. Interesting, interesting. So you mentioned this idea that uh, different labs have different um, protocol, right? So do you think mm -hmm. this is where you know, because until now, I don't think it it has been a problem, right? But the fact that we're using machine learning, right? Everything is going towards that direction. Do you think that's actually an area of machine learning could actually help us um, standardize um, the lab processes when it comes to histopathology? That is definitely an interesting uh, thought. So it's a chicken and egg problem. On the one hand, to apply machine learning reliably in and, and, and generalizable fashion, you have to have standardized data. On the other hand, uh, you're absolutely right. There are, there's lots of work and lots of interest in using machine learning itself to standardize uh, a lot of machine learning, or, or let me just be more general, computational methods and techniques and, 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 and so on to standardize how we do some of these things and um, or to at least um, you know there's some work from um, I believe Anan, uh, announced Madabushi's group who work on and where are they out of uh, where are they uh, I believe I believe they're at Case Western I don't want to get that wrong so I follow their work but I keep confusing them with other groups uh, that I follow in terms of where they are located. But, but anyway, so what they, they, they work on algorithms for quality um, uh, control at the level of, uh, at the input level. So you, 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 you detect poor quality before you input it into the algorithm and you detect that in a learned or machine learning or computational manner, whatever that may be. So again, it's a chicken and egg. Some problem have, some, some uh, groups uh, like uh, Jules Sol's group in, um, I think they're in uh, in the state uh, in SUNY uh, upstate uh, or SUNY downstate. I, I, I'm not sure, but basically what they do is they work on uh, generating synthetic data, and uh, and uh, and some groups in the Netherlands have also taken a, a different approach where they generate synthetic stains 
Uh, so they take a slide and they really alter the stains in a random and computationally generated fashion so that your algorithms would be very robust to seeing something new because they've been trained on this synthetic or random uh, uh, set of variability uh, that people have generated specifically to make your algorithm understand what is important about an image that is not the concentration of particular stains that really help, should help it make a prediction, but the actual tissue, tissue structure and biological uh, material in it, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of work in that area. And again, it's a chicken and egg problem. You probably want to tackle it both ways. Interesting, interesting. So with machine learning, um, the way we could actually sort of separate what we do in machine learning has to do with the data itself, right? So depending on if we label the data, if it's not labeled, so it could be a supervised mas machine learning problem or non-supervised machine learning problem or a reinforcement um, problem, right? So in your in your instance, uh, we're we're looking more at we're doing more work on supervised learning, right? So the approach that you've taken with labeling your data is to crowdsource the process. Now, has this ever been done before? And um, and the fact that you're doing it, have you actually? What's the progress? What's uh, I guess the end uh, result you've actually noticed in this journey you've taken? Sure. Uh, so. The idea of crowdsourcing is not new. Um, there is a lot of um, a lot of literature uh, in in, the, in in crowdsourcing generating labeled data in general. So, as you correctly pointed out, there is the idea of supervised uh, machine learning and unsupervised machine learning. Supervised is is basically learning using labeled data. Basically, some human went there and said, "This is tumor. This is a fibroblast. This is lymphocyte, and so on." Whatever problem you're trying to solve. And uh, so the idea of crowdsourcing is not new. It's uh, it's uh, it's pretty old, and it's actually a lot. Most I, I'm not sure if it's most, but a very big proportion of the data that machine learning folks use for general tasks, uh, including things that train things like driving, like self-driving cars, and and all of the recent advances you hear about, are generated using the crowd. You um, you pay people, or you have uh, you recruit volunteers uh, to do these. The main problem we were facing, and that and that and that wasn't done before, uh, is using crowds in the context of histopathology in a disseminated and large fashion. There were some groups that tried this idea, uh, did some um, initial experiments before ours that shown uh, that you can have non-experts, non-pathologists, non-medical professionals annotate some easy tasks on small uh, patches of images. And uh, the group that comes to mind here um, is Andy Beck, uh, who was at Harvard and now is, uh, a, a, you know, he started his own startup, Path AI. Uh, so so they, 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 they had some initial preliminary work. What we took, what we said is, let's take this uh, a step further and really try to generate a very large scale data set uh, using this kind of approach. Now we decided to go a little, uh, to be a little bit more cautious in um, in recruiting people. We we did not recruit complete novices. We recruited medical students uh, from different places. And one advantage that we had in our lab that certainly helped is that uh, um, our lab, in collaboration with a with a company called Kitware, they've developed this software that helps people annotate from the browser as opposed to having to install things or upload slides or anything. The volunteers simply had to go to a web address and start drawing structures. And uh, that was really a big help because uh, they, they, you know, no installation requires nothing. And um, another thing that helped was um, that this kind of software that our lab and others have developed um, uh, is, it has something called the API or Application Programming Interface where uh, as a, a study coordinator, I could interact with the data uh, in an in a, uh, algorithmic fashion. So I can tell it, please put, uh, give me all the slides that have any annotations that, for these structures and so on. Uh, so anyway, so we, we, when we decided to pursue that idea, we recruited over 30 uh, volunteers from different countries Egypt, the UAE, uh, um, we had some people from uh, the States here, um, uh, some people from Saudi Arabia, from Syria, from the Maldives, um, where else? 
you know, big collection of countries and Bangladesh as well. And, uh, and of course, that was helped by the, you know, the web-based interface. Um, anyway, so when we recruited volunteers, we told them, please, uh, in this phase of the project, we would like to annotate histological structures. Basically, you draw boundaries around things that you know are tumor, stroma, lymphocytic infiltrate, necrotic tissue, and so on. Uh, and um, in, in, in scan post light images of breast cancer. And uh, these were medical students and recent graduates, so they all had some knowledge of pathology. But I, I need to point out that their time and um, incentives are fundamentally different from pathologists, for example. Pathologists, they are under a time crunch. They need to do the diagnosis. And these tasks are very repetitive, and it's not very clear why would they want to participate in this kind of activity. They may be interested in research in general, but these activities are um, usually pathologists are are not interested in them. You can get them to work to to do these kinds of things with the proper incentives and so on, but usually they're not uh, as enticed, uh, understandably so. Uh, but if you think about a typical medical student or a medical graduate who's looking for a residency spot, uh, they typically have their interests are aligned with this kind of, with, with research work. They, they want to do research. They want to do this kind of activity. And for them, this is actually intellectually stimulating because uh, while the pathologist sees this kind of thing every day, uh, tens of times, you know, the typical medical student has some exposure to pathology, but they typically don't really spend a lot of time with slides and, and have that much interest in. So this was very, they, they, it was interesting intellectually, but also it was very aligned with their career incentives. And that's how we got the volunteers. We collected over 50,000 annotations for regions. And then when we extended the project, uh, you know, phase two, after we published phase one, uh, we got uh, about 200,000 annotations from people uh, of histological structure. Oh, wow. Interesting. Interesting. So I think this idea of uh, or this word crowdsourcing is kind of a misnomer when it comes to the work you're doing. We should actually consider it, consider it um, structured uh, crowdsourcing, right? So, you know, because when you hear crowdsourcing, it has a more informal kind of tone to it, right? So you're actually right. dealing with professionals or at least the uh, newly minted, uh, you know, doctors or medical students that actually have the, the expertise or domain knowledge in this field to begin with. Now, you did mention um, the software, right, that you used. So this would be the right. digital slide archive. Now, this is a pretty nifty web application that um, that I actually checked out my, myself, right? So when I joined the lab, so it lets uh, pathologists, I guess, manipulate, annotate, and uh, prepare histopathology images for uh, machine learning research. So I, I'm interested to know who actually thought up this uh, this idea of this this software. So who made it and how is it proliferated in uh, the field of computational pathology? So are other uh, teams using this, uh, this product? Because for me, it's very, very intuitive. Uh, uh, so the, the project was conceived um, by two, uh, back then they were associate uh, assistant professors at Emory. Uh, my current PhD advisor, Lee Cooper, and uh, Professor David Gutman, who's a neurologist at Emory, and they got the grant together for, I think, three and a half million dollars back then. It was a pretty big uh, project. And um, part of the grant was that they would uh, collaborate with a company called Kitware, uh, which has this very interesting business um, uh, portfolio where they make their money using open source software. So normally you would think, oh, you know, companies are not interested in, uh, actually, uh, most companies are not interested in open source because, you know, you spend all this time making something, you don't want to make it free, right? That's mm -hmm. the, their kind of opposing concepts. But the, the company Kitware is based on the idea that they get their money from federal grants, from uh, things like uh, our work where you, we get the grants and they get paid from the grants to make something open source using federal taxpayer money, basically. Um, and that worked, you know, that model worked pretty well. They they generated this, uh, I find it a fantastic software. This predated my joining the lab, you know, and then after I joined, I, uh, I you know, I used this software. I, I, I contributed to this software, including, you know, things to do with the application programming interface and the, the different image processing operations that it allows. 
And uh, yeah, so uh, people are using it. So uh, we have collaborators in the UK who are using this work. There are people at the NIH uh, who are using this work uh, for their analysis. And uh, yeah, different people like to, we have groups who took the open source software as is and then just extended it for their own use. Uh, and then we, we talk back to them and we're like, okay, is there any way we can use these really nice improvements that you made for your work to incorporate it into the main software and we're sort of still in the back and forth conversation uh, about this. But definitely the fact that it's web-based, that's the most um, specific thing, uh, thing about this annotation software. There are a lot of annotation softwares out there. Uh, definitely every company who joins the computational pathology space or the digital pathology space wants to have its own annotation or, or slide viewing interface. It's now become kind of almost a commodity. Everybody wants to do it. Uh, but the most definitional or specific feature for our work is that this is web-based uh, and it's free and it's installation free. And that that's really the key for doing the kind of crowdsourcing work that we do. Wow, awesome, yeah. So that's the beauty of open source software, right? <laughs> so- Absolutely. So, um. <laughs> Obviously, there has to be a, I guess, a quality control um, process, right? When it comes to the annotation the work that your uh, your volunteers are doing, right? So, can you walk us through um, the due diligence uh, by you and your team when it comes to checking the work that the annotators are doing? Sure. So, so we have to think of a way to really measure as well as control or, or improve the quality of people. So these are two separate but related concepts. Uh, let me first tell you about how quality control or quality assessment, let's say, happens in traditional crowdsourcing studies or the things that you know, self-driving cars and normal machine learning uh, people do. What they do is they get the data for the same small image or the same patch from multiple people and then they compare the people against each other and they see if they have outliers. So they have, there are different classes of algorithms. Majority voting is the simplest one, right? The, the most, if most people say this is X, then call it X. Uh, but there are much, uh, there are more sophisticated statistical approaches, including things that are uh, done by the medical community, things that take in, that estimate the participant's reliability and then using that reliability to re assess what the label should be and, and doing that in a cycle. It's called expectation maximization. So that's what happens in a traditional setting. Um, what we decided to do is a combination of both. Uh, so we collected something called, uh, what we called an evaluate, uh, a multi-rater set, let's call it that, maybe it's a simpler term. And the multi-rater set is a limited number of uh, images or patches that people annotate, and then everybody annotates the same thing. And then in our case, uh, we also had the pathologist annotate the same, uh, the same small number of limited number of images. And that basically counted as our comparison. We can, we can basically quote unquote test uh, the participants against this common set of images. Uh, but also one important thing here is that we have multiple pathologists and multiple volunteers. So you can also see the, the distribution or the variability in the annotation within the pathologist and between the pathologist and the various participants. And the people who are closer to the pathologist are arguably better, quote unquote, right? Uh, that's one way to do things and, and we did that. The other way uh, we ensured quality is that we collected the majority of data actually using one participant per, per field. And the reasoning here is that we would like to get as much data as possible and worry later about uh, inter-rater variability. So we use the small set of fields to measure the rater variability and the big set of fields where just one person does one thing to get the bulk of the data, to get a lot of data, right? Because you can imagine if multiple people are doing the same thing, you're sort of wasting effort. Uh, and then we took that field and we had a couple of study coordinators, uh, uh, myself and some, someone else who was trained uh, to do this. And basically, people who have who have more in experience with the with this thing, but they have also more time or more incentive, and a pathologist uh, to correct and uh, approve of the fields. So in this case, the pathologist, instead of uh, doing the annotations themselves, they were correcting things, right? Saying, okay, this is good, this is bad, please change this. 
um, telling the volunteers what to do. So they had a more supervisory role, which is way, 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 way less effort uh, compared to doing things from scratch. And that's how we ensure the quality. Uh, another way that we uh, assess truth, uh, or another way that some people decide, decide to do things, and we did this in some other parts of our work, is that uh, for, for some data, we actually didn't necessarily need pathologists, but we used this method that I told you is used in the general crowdsourcing literature, where we use the should sort of see the participants against each other and see the outliers and we know this is bad data. But this is limited in the sense that medical students, they're reliable for certain things, but you can't really decide on wisdom of the crowd to perform a task that is too specialized for the crowd. No matter how wise the crowd is, they're not going to be able to do things they're not trained for. So that's why we mostly use the correction by pathologists as our way of quality control. Okay, wow, perfect, perfect. So that's a very succinct uh, explanation of uh, the process. So now we have we have our data, right? So we have judicious uh, annotators. They've done the work and you know it's all tied up in a nice ribbon. They give it to us, right? So now the next step is to train our machine learning models, right? So in your case, uh, you use a uh, pre-trained uh, fully connected convolutional networks. So for the uninitiated, can you please explain what that is? And uh, by the way, uh, why use uh, pre-trained models as opposed to models that you actually train from the ground up? Okay, I will answer your second question first. So pre-trained models are models that have already been trained to perform a particular task using a lot of data that we have for that task. So for example, in our case, and typically, definitely what we did is not an invention, we didn't invent this, it's, uh, it's widely used in our uh, discipline uh, and in general in the machine learning and deep learning uh, um, fields, is you would look at a field where you have a lot of data. And uh, in this case, it, there's a, a, a data set called ImageNet, and that is basically a data set that was generated using volunteers and companies and you know paying people and so on, that has things like cat, dog, um, you know, uh, table, whatever, right? Just general things, right? And one thing that was noticed, even in the earliest work on deep learning, even the maybe the first work, serious, the first like maybe widespread adoption of, of uh, deep learning happened after a paper from someone called Jeff Hinton, who's in Canada. Uh, he works with Google, and and their lab basically when they described the first uh, convolutional neural network, they noticed that the these filters, so these neural networks, these convolutional networks learn a series of filters. So basically a weights that basically go through an image, right? And learn to apply a certain number of operate, operations to each pixel and its neighborhood, right? And then when you apply these filters, so, you know, just to define what a filter is, think of a blur filter, things to make a photo blurred or a sharpening filter, things that, you know, people on Instagram would, Instagram, they would do yeah, or, yes. <laughs> right? So these are all filters. Yes. You, you, you move things into a, a, each pixel in your image and you look at its neighborhood and you multiply it by a certain set of operations to do something, increase the blur, whatever, right? And so these convolutional neural networks, maybe the, the biggest achievement that the deep learning has is that you don't, that these are automatically learned through a process called gradient descent. Uh, basically, it's, it, the filters are started randomly, and then you, you look at the output, you compare it to what you want, and then you calculate uh, the gradient using basically calculus. And then that gradient tells you how to uh, change your filters uh, to be closer to the target that you would like to go to. So in, in pre-training, and, and so, so coming back to the phenomenon that was discovered, it was discovered that the initial filters in the deep neural network typically learn um, the very simple patterns, edges, uh, uh, lines, and so on. And then you go deeper into the con convolutional model, and then you learn more higher order things, like if you're doing face detection, for example, which is the example they use, then you'd be detecting the nose, the eye, the, the mouth. And then you go deeper into the model, that's where you make your final classifications. Then one 
neuron would be correspond to the face uh, or a cat or a dog. And this is, by the way, it's very similar to, at least conceptually, to the way biological neural networks work, basically our visual system, visual system which works yes. in the exact same, so, exact same way. We have, you know, retinal ganglion cells in, in our retina. And then, you know, as you go deeper and deeper into the, the visual system, there's even something called the grandmother mother cell hypothesis and it's the idea that you know at some point there's going to be a cell that only fires if you see your own grandmother that's how specialized things get now that's kind of a controversial uh, theory but but yeah. the idea of hierarchical representation is, is sure. there in biology sure. um, so the model we use is based on pre-trained models basically we take all of these things that have been learned on using so much data Right, and learned all of these, uh, learned to extract these general patterns that are going to be carried over to any problem you try to solve, including ours. But they were trained on so much data, you, you know, cats and dogs and so on. And then we cut the last layer that was supposed to make the final prediction. So, in that way, we've used all of the data that was unrelated to our task, things to, to cats and dogs, and used it to learn, at least use what the models have learned in terms of edge detection and detection of simple patterns. And then we only train the last convolutional filters to learn these final concepts that, okay, use all of these edges that you've learned from something else, use them to learn if this is tumor or stroma or lymphocytic. Wow, that's, that's a very good uh, explanation of, I guess, uh, hierarchical spatial learning, right? So um, right. we tend to think of um, machine learning models as being, um, feature invariant, right? So if you see a certain edge in one place, you should be able to detect it in another place, right? So that's basically what you're uh, trying to say. So if we look at maybe um, a machine learning model as a building, right? So the lower floors are more general uh, features, general um, edges, right? Things like that. So, but the higher you go up in your model, right? The more, um, I'd say applied, the more specialized um, your features are, right? Correct. That's absolutely correct. That's uh, probably the best um, uh, description of how things are related because the, the lower floors are probably arguably more important in a building and that's exactly how it is also in convolutional models and, and deep learning models in general. Mm, perfect, perfect. Now, so can you talk about the training process, right? And uh, what you noticed uh, from your results when it comes to uh, the data provided by the different annotators, right? So did you guys actually do any comparisons between data you got from one cohort compared to another? That's correct, yes, we did. Uh, so we compared the, um, the annotations we got from non-pathologists, which in this case are medical students and, and fresh graduates, uh, and pathologists, uh, and actually two, maybe two tiers of pathologists, junior pathologists who are people who didn't have uh, at least two years of anatomical pathology uh, training, and quote unquote senior in the sense that they uh, senior pathologists in the sense that they have had more than two years of residency training. Uh, that's kind of an arbitrary differentiation, but, but anyway, so that's what we chose. Um, so in general, um, you you um, you take pathologists as your frame of reference, particularly senior pathologists as your frame of reference. Uh, but even within those, you're going to have some sort of variability, and you can compare the variability between the two. Now, what we found is that there is some clustering by exp uh, participants' experience. So there's no way to tell, you know, who's better or who's worse. You'd assume, of course, that pathologists are better uh, at a task. Uh, but uh, but there is, a, but we do in an unsupervised way. If you cluster things, we see that the pathologists tend to cluster together meaning that there is some systemic, some minor systemic difference between how pathologists are detecting these things and how non-pathologists are detecting these things. Essentially, this is something you would intuitively think is true. You know, the residency training and, and experience helps, even with things that you think should be simple tasks, which is what we apply this to. So that's one finding. The other finding is that, yes, there's that moderate clustering, that's uh, this minor clustering, but really, the data we get from the pathologist is very highly concordant with what the pathologist gets for, and that's an important qualifier, for the predominant visually distinctive patterns. So the non-pathologists are reliable annotators 
of things like tumor, stroma, lymphocytic infiltrate in the context of breast cancer, which is what we studied, uh, but they weren't reliable annotators. They had a lot of discordance with the, non, with the pathologists for things that you would think are kind of more specialized or more difficult structures. Uh, uh, to, to, there is some, uh, for example, there's a higher discordance for, for finding necrosis. A lot of non-pathologists were confused between stroma and necrotic tissue, and they kind of confused these two things. Uh, there was, uh, of course, a lot of di discordance for all of the rare uh, and, and things that you need to learn as opposed to just, you know, reading a one hour tutorial, watching an one hour tutorial and being tested on it, which is what we did with the participants. So all of these rare and, and, and uncommon patterns, definitely you need a pathologist for that. For, but for the majority of your data set, the, the bulk of it, the visually distinctive patterns, um, non-pathologists with adequate training uh, are uh, sufficient. And that's good news, of course. For Interesting. Us. So what you're saying is we need to be cognizant of the skill level of our annotators. And in addition to that, um, the different pathology classes need to be taken into consideration as well, because the skill level of our annotators could actually affect how they see certain pathologies as well. That's absolutely correct. The, the project is, so our, our basically conclusions, if you will, is that you, to, to do this kind of annotation effort, it's great. You can have non-pathologists do the majority of the work, but you will need a pathologist in the loop for correction and supervision. That's a, that's a given. You cannot just say, uh, hey, uh, Amgad and, and, then, and his colleagues have found that non-pathologists are reliable, so there you go, it's a free lunch. Uh, no, you really do need pathologist supervision in the end. Uh, it, maybe high level supervision, but definitely you need the supervision. Okay, so you mentioned loops, right? So I, I assume you're talking about feedback loops. So um, did you did you notice any improvement in annotation uh, when certain uh, pathologists, so the higher level pathologists basically give feedback to maybe like the medical school students or the non-pathologists? Um, so we did not measure that effect. Um, but uh, I would expect, of course, that the feedback gives an, uh, gives, uh, makes a difference. So what we did measure is we m uh, measured the uncorrected versus the corrected fields against each other, right? So the, but, but even the uncorrected fields, the non-pathologists were given feedback as they were annotating their work, right? So they, 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 they uh, we used Slack. Uh, for uh, you know a Slack group, and, and basically the medical student would go and say, uh, "Hey, I'm, I'm I'm working on this slide, and I'm seeing this pattern. I'm not sure what it is. What can you can you help me out?" And then the pathologist or the uh, pathology resident would go and say, "Yeah, that's probably tumor, or yeah, that's probably stroma, or let me take a look and I'll get back to you." Things like that. So they, that effect, if the feedback itself gave some made a difference. We're not sure because we, we we assumed it would and we used that as a feature of how the annotation was done. But even given that, after every, you know, the non-pathologists make their annotation, not everybody's going to ask a question and they're not always going to know that they're making a mistake. So then we went on and corrected things, right? That made the pathologist correction, the study coordinators, and, and then we compared the uncorrected, you know, the first version, if you will, with the corrected or the second version that people did. And yes, we did notice a difference and most of the difference related to these uncommon classes. Basically a pathologist saying, I can understand why someone would make a mistake about this, but this is not X, it's something else. These, these are the kind of mistakes we often saw. Interesting, interesting. So. Um... I want us to do a case study on one pathology, right? So let's take, for example, um, the tumor infiltrated uh, lymphocytes, right? So these would be uh, B cells and T cells that have migrated to uh, tumors in the body, right? So previously we've used a uh, visual um, tumor infiltrated lymphocyte assessment to uh, do this, right? So now we're using computational tumor infiltrated lymphocyte assessments. So um, have we seen any encouraging results? Uh, can we talk about that? At least sure. pertaining to um, TILs, so um, lymphocytes. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, TILs is the shorthand for tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, as you pointed out. And these are 
uh, markers, they're considered to be markers of how well our body's defense, our immune system, is doing in fighting the cancer, if you will. Uh, so they've been known to have an important role in a certain subset of breast cancer for a very, very, very long time. Uh, and um, something called medullary cancer. And, you know, even some of the earliest description of, of this subset, I think in, I'm, I'm not sure when, but it was a very early time, maybe even the 60s or, or, or so, a very long time ago. But the thing is, people didn't use to actually quantify these or check it as part of the grading criteria, as part of making assessment as to whether this tumor is likely to be uh, responding to therapy or not, if it's likely to uh, go on and, and spread to, to the body and, and, and so on. And of course, you want to see more of those. The more you see, the, it means that your body is fighting back. That's what you want to see. And recently, in 2014, specifically, uh, there, well, I mean, before 2014, there were clinical trials that were coming in and saying, hey, uh, you know this thing that we knew occurs in this subset of breast cancer? It's actually prognostic. And if you see more of it, the patient is going to live longer. And then people said, yeah, that's great. And then people started seeing it, pathologists basically, right? Uh, but then they noticed that there's a lot of variability. One person would look at this area of the slide and find, you know, a lot of lymphocytes and say, okay, this patient is going to live for a long time. Someone else looks at this other part of the slide and sees nothing. Uh, or even two people looking at the same field and making different assessments. So much variability there. So, so people were starting to lose hope in actually using that in stratifying patients, which is very important. You need to know who's going to live or who's not going to live, and, and because you also base your treatment decisions on that kind of thing, right? So this group, uh, and someone called Roberto Salgado and, and, and colleagues, they came up with this uh, really elaborate set of rules, if you will, for reliably manually assessing this kind of patterns uh, in, in slides for pathologists. And that was a paper that came out in 2014 and since then became sort of a classic in how people um, assess these things. Um, we, um, around 2017 or so, uh, I was doing my internship at, uh, at Broche and uh, we decided, okay, let's make a computational tumor infiltrating lymphocyte algorithm. And, uh, and that was in collaboration with my uh, current PG advisor as well. And we came up with this set of rules. You know, we went to the, this set of rules from the manual assessment and we said, okay, let's try to be as close as possible to this. So we, we used the convolutional neural network, the thing I discussed before, to look at things at different powers. So things, low power or low magnification things, these are the patterns, you know, regions, tumor regions, stroma, lip slides, and so on, as well as very high power, detailed morphologic things like individual cells, individual nuclei. And to basically combine these things and make an assessment. And we saw very encouraging results. We saw that uh, our algorithm uh, was high, you know, strongly correlated with the scores that the pathologists manually uh, make uh, using, of course, the standardized guidelines, if you will, right? And one finding that we found quite interesting is the variability that the two pathologists had between them was higher than the variability between our algorithm and their consensus. Wow. Uh, so, wow. so let me break that down. The pathologists sit after they make their ind independent assessments, they sit down together and they say, okay, let's go through this, you know, 200 slides and agree. Right. Wow. And then we compare our algorithm to their consensus versus them against each other, and we find a higher correlation there. So there's really tremendous potential uh, in that field. And later on, when we met with uh, Dr. Roberto Salgado, who made those initial guidelines, um, uh, he, he got some interest in, in our work. And right now we're working on a lot of um, um, really pushing for having our and, and related computational assessment techniques uh, be uh, studied systematically in clinical trials and, uh, and hopefully paving the way, fingers crossed, uh, for it being used in a clinical setting, in a real-world setting uh, for diagnostics. 
Wow, that's so encouraging, right? The fact that we could actually use these um, algorithms to augment the work of our pathologists, right? It makes me feel warm inside. <laughs> I hope so. so <laughs> hope, hopefully it works as well as we would like it to do. <laughs> like it to do. All right. So according to one of your papers, right? So sticking to the issue of computational uh, uh, tumor infiltrated lymphocytes uh, assessment, right? So this process is split into two, right? So there's segmentation and then there's the analysis, right? The inferencing. So can you actually kind of touch on both um, aspects just quickly? Sure. So the, the, you start with detection of patterns, mm -hmm. right? Detection of these low power regions and, 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 uh, and cells and so on. And then once your model has learned to do these things, you want to actually apply them to get a number, right? So the, the TIL scoring is basically one number per slide. You say, this patient has 70% of their intratumoral stroma infiltrated by lymphocytes or 10% or 20%, you know, some number. Mm -hmm. And to go from that stage to the other, we had to, you know, have some extra steps. So once you have the algorithm is trained, now you want to apply it to a new slide. That's called inference, right? And all of these weights that you've learned, you freeze them, right? And then when you get a new slide, your training was done on a limited number of patches that humans uh, have annotated and so on. At inference, now you ha you've learned those weights, so you can really get the slide, push all the, you know, break it down as we talked in the beginning that these slides are very large. So you detect where the main tissue is, and then you just push it through this trained set of filters uh, to get to your prediction. So really what you want to do is you're going to have a, the same weights being carried over from what you trained on from training to inference, but the procedure is going to be different because in training you have this limited set of manual patches and you know and you're calculating these gradients and comparing and so on. But at inference, you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. You just use the weights that you've already learned to get these results. And it's usually much more efficient uh, as well because you don't have to do any of those extra calculations. Interesting. So um, that actually kind of segues uh, perfectly into my next question. So in your experience, um, I know this could be a bit subjective, but um, what characteristic uh, properties of different cells could actually cause misclassification in the training uh, process, right? So cells like uh, lymphocytes, stroma cells, um, what, what about these cells, right? These different cells can cause misclassification. Right, so here's an informal um, observation that I can probably make confidently and, and not worry about people uh, being offended or anything. Uh, you cannot really make a computational algorithm to do something uh, that a human cannot do very well. Uh, now, I'm not saying you cannot make an algorithm to do something quantitatively better than a human. You can always go quantitatively better than humans because we are not quantitative creatures. Uh, you know, our biology, we evolved into these highly qualitative things. We, we, we mostly worry about the general, how to categorize things, uh, you know, in, in generally speaking. That's how we evolved as a species. That's what we are doing. But in, but in terms of category, if there's a pattern that is difficult categorically, and qualitatively for people to assess, I, I, I have very uh, limited um, confidence in a computational model being able to supersede a human qualitatively. Mm -hmm. So this, that's what we also observe. You know, any pattern where the human annotator is not reliable for, or, or and, and we can actually measure reliability of people by looking at the iterator variability, uh, or even looking at the effect of the same person getting trained in a particular discipline. So for example, in some of our recent work, um, we uh, observed that uh, the non-pathologists are not very reliable for detecting mitotic figures, for example, uh, these you know dividing cells, if you will, which is of course in cancer, a lot of pathologists, a lot of the pathology guidelines will tell you to go at the high magnification and try to count these things uh, because it's a measure of how well, how much your cancer is dividing and spreading, right? Uh, we found that non pathologists are not very liable. So we know that, you know, as you train 
you become better at these things, which means that non-pathologists are qualitatively bad at this kind of task. Now, when we train the model using their annotations, we don't see anything earth shattering. The model just learns what it sees. It sees data that is kind of questionable. It will produce predictions that are uh, questionable. So that's really the most important, most fundamental uh, factor that is going to determine how well. Uh, these models are going to are fantastic function approximators. They're fantastic uh, 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 pattern recognition uh, machines that can learn any pattern whatsoever, provided that the pattern is reliable, that there is really a pattern. You can't expect it to, to discover a pattern out of thin air. Uh, there has to be a pattern. And if you're and if we're talking about supervised machine learning, i.e. using labeled data, that pattern has to be also well annotated, well represented in your training data. All right, cool. I appreciate the fact that uh, you're not as, uh, you know, sanguine as, you know, most people are when it comes to machine <laughs> learning, right, and artificial intelligence, right? So we think it's gonna, you know, I mean, it is disruptive, but to an extent, right? So like you said, it's not going to discover things that are not there, or at least that most human beings that are skilled in uh, this field won't see themselves, right? So, um, yeah. all right. So I guess now that actually takes us to, you know, using these systems in uh, the workplace, right? Using them in the lab or in hospital settings, right? So how do you envision these models, because now we, let's say we have a good model, it's a good enough model, and we feel that, okay, we're confident in its abilities, right? So how do you think we can actually integrate it into uh, the medical pipeline, and it actually fits nicely, and it doesn't cause any friction uh, in the process, right? So we want it, like we said, we want it to augment the work that our um, professionals are doing. How do you envision that happening? Right, so there's a lot of, um, let's just say there's a lot of schools of thought uh, in that field. So a lot of people are interested in the idea, or at least um, we'll try to push the narrative that we really want algorithms to do things end-to-end, -end, replace the pathology, at least in the, in the media, you see this kind of thing. And really that's not what we're trying to do, or that's not, I don't really see that happening uh, anytime in my lifetime at least. Uh, and um, I think I'm pretty young, I'm 29 years old, so not anytime soon, right? Assuming I don't die tomorrow. So this is not the goal. The goal here is to really have these algorithms, as you correctly pointed out, uh, supplement what the pathologists are doing uh, in a computer-aided diagnostics way, or even in a way that helps us with discovery. So let me, uh, but, but I'll focus here on the computer-aided uh, uh, component. So let's say, the, you know, one of the famous studies that, that came out, I think, two years ago, or maybe a little bit more, I'm, I'm uh, fuzzing out, but there was this study where they, uh, you know, pathologists spent all this time looking at lymph nodes, trying to find if, the, if, the, if there's metastases, if, if the tumor has spread, to the lymph nodes. And these lymph nodes are basically these filtration uh, machines that um, contain a lot of uh, you know, immune cells and so on, right? So uh, in the case of breast cancer, for example, the, the breast would empty in these axillary lymph nodes, right? And one of the earliest indications if the cancer has spread is you take something called the, a sentinel lymph node, the, the first lymph node that it, to which the cancer drains, you take that, you look at it under the microscope, you try to find where the cancer has cracked. If, if there is a small focus or a small area of cancer in the middle of the sea of immune cells that are normal structures in the, in the and this is a very, very, very time consuming task. So, you know, one of the famous papers that came out, they, they, they made algorithms that would tell you that, you know, would, would look at the lymph nodes and tell you, here is probably you know, a tumor, you, you know, look in this area. And one of the interesting findings that they got in this paper, which is a big collaboration, people in Netherlands and US and, and elsewhere, is that if you have algorithm alone, uh, you do pretty well. If you have human alone, you do pretty well. If you have algorithm plus human, you do a better job actually at detecting these metastases. So the idea is, the human humans feel tired and 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 and, uh, and fatigued and uh, and they are not necessarily gonna 
Uh, and it's also extremely time consuming to go through all of these fields in a slide. You see a pathologist looking and just pushing this small slide under the microscope to look for each small foci. Imagine if you have the algorithm just immediately tell them, uh, hey, look in this area, I think there's probably cancer here. And then you look and you're like, yep, there's cancer here. You don't have to look through a thousand other fields. You already know this tumor has moved to this lymph node. So these kinds of things are not only close to application, I think they're very, very close to being uh, almost, you know, to being, you know, used in a real diagnostic setting. These are things that are extremely rapidly progressing, this kind of computer-aided diagnostic brute force visual recognition kind of thing. Uh, the other way to envision things, uh, other than, you know, brute force things, is subtle, is the detection of subtle patterns that humans can detect but they cannot quantify, as I mentioned. Qualitatively, they can understand what these are, but they can't quantitatively uh, uh, get the numbers. For example, the tumor infiltrating uh, lymphocyte, like, um, you know, the human can tell you there are lymphocytes in this field, but really estimating the density, right? Uh, who does that, like, realistically speak? Uh, but a computer is very good at counting. You know, anything involving counting, quantifying, computers are good at. So you can imagine this kind of thing where the human tells, you know, make, marks up a small area and tells, him, tells the computer, please just give me the density of pills here, and it tells them 80%. And the human looks, yeah, that looks more or less 80%. That's good. As opposed to the human just making their subjective judgment, and then here we see a lot of variability between people. And a lot of variability is bad for the patients because one pathologist may think, oh, this is 50%. Someone else may think it's 80%. And then the treatment decisions are based on that, and you don't want that for the patient. You don't want to go too aggressive when you can go less aggressive and, and have, of course, have your patient experience less side effects uh, and less dangers from the treatment itself. And, of course, you don't want to be unaggressive when you need to be aggressive. So you need both. Uh, so these are kind of the two areas where we really see um, – immediate applicability of these. There's a lot of things for future applicability, but immediate applicability, these are the two areas. Oh, interesting, interesting. So um, let's talk about the regulatory uh, processes and checkpoints that might come into play or already coming into play when it comes to um, algorithms being used in a medical setting, right? So um, how has uh, the FDA and other regulatory bodies um, how have they started looking at machine learning in the medical field? And do you have you ever heard anything, any mummers about uh, regulations that are in place or we envision to be in place in the future? Right. This is actually a, a very, very important uh, area. And mm -hmm. the reason it's important is that the regulatory domain has not yet uh, uh, caught up to uh, a lot of the things that are being, uh, which is normal. This is, a, you know, just I need to say that this is the natural order of things. People start creating algorithms and creating uh, assays and so on. And then, of course, the regulatory bodies start thinking, okay, how do you regulate these? How do we, FDA, you know, how do these things get FDA approval and so on? Uh, so uh, the reason, of course, you were mentioning the FDA is, uh, you, you know, uh, some of the work that we're doing is uh, we, uh, we were called on by the FDA, or at least um, got in, in touch with the FDA, who are interested in preemptively uh, getting the, the data they need to validate a lot of these up-and-coming uh, algorithms for computational assessment of pills, uh, of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And uh, they, uh, like I said, there is a tremendous lack of data, so the FDA uh, the one way to, to validate if an algorithm works is, of course, to look at the end result. Uh, does it predict if the patient's going to live or die? But that's a very long-term, weaker signal that, you know, you need lots of clinical trials and, and so on. And, and, um, and generally speaking, when you want to validate, you want to have a lot of safe, safeguards. You don't want to just see if it predicts if the patient is going to live or die, but I mean, what if what if it happens that your algorithm that you think is detecting tumor infiltrating lymphocytes is actually just detecting the invasion of the tumor and it's not, you know, really uh, giving any independent uh, predictive value, for example. So you, you, you generally want to have analytic variability, what is called analytic variability, which is 
if you have these kinds of algorithms, you also want to make sure that they're actually detecting what they say they are detecting. Uh, so kind of an interpretability flavor to what your model is detecting, as opposed to just saying, here's a number, let's see if it correlates, right? So the FDA started saying, okay, we need data, and we need data that is not public so that nobody has access to it uh, so that we can compare against. And um, uh, they worked together with um, the original group that created the manual assessment guidelines, Roberto uh, Salgado and colleagues, as well as our uh, research group and others, uh, a lot of other groups here in the U.S. to uh, just um, create, use, use similar crowdsourcing techniques as in that we worked on, uh, but for pathologists this time. So to crowdsource pathologists to create regulatory grade data that they have internally at the FDA, not published, but when someone says, hey, I, I have this algorithm that detects pills and it's really cool and we would like to push it to doctors, the FDA says, okay, hold on a minute, give me that algorithm, let me see if it works on my internal data, and if it works well enough, then I can give you the approval. Wow, that's interesting. So um, you did mention um, clinical trials, right? So besides augmenting uh, the work pathologists are doing, right? So how else do you think machine learning can uh, augment maybe fields of uh, comparative medicine? So um, animal trials and also randomized uh, clinical trials in humans? Right. So there's a lot of ways in which, uh, so one way is the computer assisted setting in the sense that you can have the trial uh, itself be influenced by computational predictions along the way. So that's one way uh, in which you, know, you can have human in the loop uh, in the decision-making process, for example. If, you, if we're talking more broadly about machine learning, uh, the decision to put someone in a particular group or, or a particular arm of the trial could be uh, uh, governed. Like, for example, you can imagine conceptually um, you know, people have all these criteria for, for putting people in one arm of the trial or, or, or determining eligibility, sorry, put it, putting people in one arm or the other is random, but determining eligibility is based on a criteria. And you could imagine sort of in the not too distant future, people saying uh, your, um, yeah, the, al the algorithm has to predict that you are eligible for this particular trial given all of your traits, something like that. Uh, or the algorithm has, as uh, there, we have an algorithm that learns to predict which people are likely to respond to the drug um, given their genomic profiles. And we use that as one of our eligibility criteria for entering the trial in the first place. So this kind of work uh, is one area where the algorithms can help. But the other less explored, very exciting area, but, but kind of longer term, is the detection of uh, rich spatial and morphological uh, and even genomic uh, features, deep features, if you will. And the idea is um, uh, you can you can have a human tell you that this is a lymphocyte, this is a tumor, this is stroma, this is blah, blah, blah. But you, but you can, it's really the algorithms, these uh, really strong function, function, function approximators and, and, and so on that can tell you, okay, what's the exact distance on average between each tumor and each lymphocyte in this particular sample? Uh, what is the number of lymphocytes within a, a you know 50 micron radius of, of the tumor cell, and how does that impact the diagnosis of our patient, and so on? The extractment of this very rich set of features is a huge has a huge untapped uh, area, and then you can imagine uh, in the future, possibly not too distant future, people using these features as biomarkers in and of themselves. So, you know, someone uh, comes in uh, with breast cancer, for example, and we take her sample, we, we, we scan her, the slide, and then the computer detects all of these things and then gives us, uh, you know, 50 features that are morphologic features that are very complex for a human to manually detect. And then we, these are the features that we can use for clinical trial eligibility or for her, uh, for predicting how likely she is to respond to certain therapeutics and other, how long she's likely to live and therefore uh, the possibility of uh, end of care, of care versus aggressive treatments, all of these things. Uh, who knows what kind of patterns we can discover with this kind of analysis. Wow. Interesting. Interesting. So, um, Dr. Amgad, I'd say, wow, it's been over an hour now. <laughs> and, uh, 
Yeah, this this was great. So um, actually, I feel kind of guilty because, uh, like I said, I just uh, joined your lab uh, not too long ago. So this almost seems like I'm having like a private, you know, tutor session, right? And uh, this is uh, not only going <laughs> to, you know, interest the audience of the podcast. This is actually a learning experience for me to actually help me, um, I guess, join the lab and gel well with the work the, the lab is doing. So I really appreciate that. So um. Um, now, if Thank anyone, you. yeah, no problem. So if anyone wants to get a hold of you or read more of your work, your papers, how can they uh, do that? Sure. So I have a personal website uh, that I created recently. It's at mamgad.com, uh, where I typically would have my latest. Uh, and of course, uh, my Google Scholar profile uh, is where they will find the latest you know, citations and, and papers and so on. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Awesome. So, uh, Dr. Amgad, uh, I can't thank you enough for this. Uh, this was uh, very illuminating for me, and I'm pretty sure anyone who's interested in computational pathology has a lot of gems they can take away from this podcast episode. Thank you. Thank you for hosting me and for the beautiful introduction, and it's always a pleasure to talk to you. I, I, uh, I really enjoy talking to you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.